the San Andreas Fault of California, some earthquakes triggered by gravitational tug of the sun and moon. Now there are those that say, no, this doesn't happen. Well, geologists found that, yes, it does happen. This is by uh, phys.org, Rosanna Xia, Los Angeles Times. The gravitational tug between the sun and moon is not just a dance of high and low tides. It also triggers a special kind of earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. This phenomenon has fascinated scientists for years. Like the sea levels, the surface of the earth also goes up and down with the tides, flexing the crust, stressing the faults inside. A further study found that during certain phases of the tidal cycle, small tremors deep underground, known as low-frequency earthquakes, were more likely to occur. Quote, it's kind of crazy, right? That the moon, when it's pulling in the same direction as the fault is slipping, causes the fault to slip more and faster, end quote, said Nicholas van der Elst at a U.S. Geological Survey Geophysicist and lead author of the new study on the subject published Monday in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences. He said what it shows is that the fault is super weak, much weaker than we would expect, given that there's 20 miles of rock sitting on top of it, end quote. Studying how these low-frequency earthquakes respond to the tides can reveal new information about the San Andreas and what it might mean for larger earthquakes, researchers say. The data offer a window into deeper parts of the fault as much as 20 miles underground that would otherwise be inaccessible. Scientists first discovered these deeper tremors on the fault about just recently, 10 years ago, along a particularly sensitive section in Parkfield, California, where the San Andreas transitions from its north northern section where it's gently releasing tectonic energy to its southern portion, which is locked and capable of producing a big one. Locked and loaded, as they said. They've been saying that for the past five years, definitely. Now, for his most recent study, van der Elst and his team looked at about 81,000 low-frequency earthquakes from 2008 to 2015 along the Parkfield section of the fault, and he compared it to the two-week tidal cycle known as the fortnightly tide. Fortnightly tide, quote unquote. They found that these earthquakes were most likely to occur during the waxing period when the tide was getting bigger the faster. Like ocean tides, the strongest earth tides occur when the sun and moon are aligned. That's like a planetary alignment. Hmm. So you see we have more earthquakes during planetary alignments as our friend Terrell Blackstar says. Now, like ocean tides, the strongest earth tides occur when the sun and moon are aligned, and the weakest occur when they are 90 degrees apart. The same gravitational forces stretch and compress the Earth's crust, through the, though the rock moves less dramatically than seawater, of course. Some faults are more susceptible to tidal triggering than others, such as offshore faults like the Cascadia subduction zone off the Pacific Northwest coast, scientists said. Again, some faults are more susceptible to tidal triggering than others, such as the Cascadia subduction zone. Other characteristics of the fault, such as its orientation or how close it is to the Earth's crust, also affect the tidal response. It's remarkable that the San Andreas even produces small earthquakes in response to tidal forces, researchers said, given that the fault is not oriented in a way that gets the full strength of the tides. Low-frequency earthquakes, they're called low-frequency for the rumbling sound they make, not for their rate of occurrence, tend to have magnitudes less than 1 Richter and occur at about 15 to 30 kilometers, about 90 19 miles below ground, nearing the deepest part of the crust where it transitions to the Earth's mantle. The significance here is less the earthquake themselves and more the important the information they're giving scientists about the deeper parts of the fault, said USGS seismologist David Shelley, who helped write the new study. Quote, they tell us that the fault continues down below where the regular or typical earthquake stops on the San Andreas, about 10 to 12 kilometers, that's about six to seven miles, Shelley said, 
And they tell us a lot of things about that deep part of the fault that before we had no idea existed at all. They also show that this part of the San Andreas is creeping or slowly moving almost all the time. San Andreas is creeping or slowly moving almost all the time. These low frequency earthquakes with the help of tidal forces have essentially created a natural laboratory for scientists to keep tabs on the fault's movements. Quote, it's almost like having a lot of little creep meters embedded in the fault, Shelley said. We can use these low frequency earthquakes as measurements of at least in the relative sense how much slip is happening at each little spot on the deep part of the fault where we see these events. When we don't see them, we don't know what's happening. We don't know whether it's slipping silently or not slipping at all, end quote. The information is incredibly useful, he added. Whenever the deep part of the fault slips, the stress gets transferred to the shallow part of the fault. Well, that's not good news, but it happens. He said, so if all of a sudden we saw that the deep part of the fault was slipping a huge amount, it might be an indication that there was an increased chance of having an earthquake come at the shallower part of the fault, end quote. By looking at how the rate of activity varied over a two-week tidal cycle, Van der Elst and Shelley found in their most recent study that the fault produced more low-frequency earthquakes if the tidal stress was larger than it was the day before. It's like the fault has an earthquake budget, Van der Elst explained. If you use them up yesterday, you don't have as many to trigger today. But actually measuring that, we get an estimate of what that stress budget is. Essentially, scientists now have a way to measure the false recharge time in certain locations. Scientifically, it's really cool because we don't have any other way to directly estimate that number. The rate at which stress is accumulating on the fault, Van der Elst said. This is another study that's adding to our knowledge of how faults work in this transition. But he added, we don't quite know yet what is going, it's going to mean in the long term, whether it'll result in some sort of warning that an earthquake is coming. We're going to have to monitor it for a longer time, a lot longer, he said. Now, we recently had a lot of earthquake activity, especially in Southern California, Los Angeles area. Looking at USGS, we see that we have at least 10 earthquakes this past week uh, at Riverside. And out on San Clemente Island, just about 200 miles southwest of Riverside in the ocean, the island of uh, San Clemente, we had over a, a swarm of 10 earthquakes, uh, the biggest being 4.3, uh, 15 kilometers west of San Clemente Island in California. And uh, they're still ongoing. And I don't know what this, uh, I, I, I'm trying to get tectonic information on this. I don't know, I guess it looks like an outcrop of, it must be something there. It, it looks like it's a, uh, when you look at the section of it, it looks like a seamount. Uh, it looks like a seamount. Outer Santa Barbara Channel, St. Nicholas Basin, San Diego Trough, uh, it's off the coast of San Diego, between um, Los Angeles and San Diego. San Clemente Island, at least from what I can see, how many earthquakes are there? I don't know if they're reporting all of them. Um, maybe they're only re the ones here are only above 2.5 magnitude. Um, there's a naval base, Conrado, Nelson, Clemente Island. San Clemente Island, Con Naval Base Conrado. Is that, am I saying that correctly? I'm looking at this from the map. So, yeah, it's um, quite active. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial 
subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media, and not certainly on, not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece, and Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.